Welcome to this special episode of the History of European Theatre podcast. This is the second in a series of three episodes where I'm in conversation with theatre practitioners, talking mostly about Greek and very early theatre and how the earliest plays still work for us today. All these conversations were recorded over Zoom, as at the time of recording we're only slowly coming out of the pandemic lockdown in the UK. This episode is with Tamsin Shasha, who is an actor, director and aerial performer, so our conversation really focused on Tamsin's experiences in performing, staging and adapting Greek plays for the modern audience, including in an educational setting. The enthusiasm that Tamsin has for these plays just rolls off her and I certainly found it infectious. So, for the next 40 minutes or so, please come and be immersed in the world of Greek drama. First off, I asked Tamsin to tell me a bit about her company, The Actors of Dionysus. Well, hello, I'm Tamsin Shasha and I'm Artistic Director of Actors of Dionysus and we're a national and international touring company and charity, registered charity, uh, that began our life in 1993, so uh, well over 25 years ago. Um, Started our life in Fife, um, in the East Nuke of Fife, in Scotland, and then moved steadily south, although we stopped off in York and spent five years in York, and now we're based in Brighton. And uh, so we tour the country specialising in new adaptations of ancient Greek drama, comedy and tragedy, and new writing inspired by myth. And our mission statement is to uh, continually strive to reinvent and transform this ancient canon of work, um, expanding our output, championing diversity and providing opportunities for young people to engage creatively. Um, I guess in a nutshell, our mission statement is to make magic from myth by reframing the classics for the 21st century and making it as relevant, accessible and transformative uh, through the high quality work that we do, which we hope will spark debate um, and immediate engagement with the larger global issues. It's been difficult during a pandemic because we haven't been able to get out there, but we we did do a show in the midst of the pandemic, actually, sort of when the lockdown lifted last October. Um, so we have been doing, we have been doing quite a lot of stuff. In fact, we're very busy. Yeah, that's good to hear because uh, there are um, obviously a lot of people who are struggling at the moment in many different ways w- throughout the industry. And I guess the whole opening up that's coming soon, we hope, will uh, be a challenge as well in many ways. Very, very challenging because, um, for example, we're hoping to do one or two shows in June at the um, slightly delayed Brighton Fringe. And um, even the, the week between the 21st, I think, and the 27th of June, the, the guidelines changed. I think it's on the 21st that they change um, in terms of outdoor theatre and what you're allowed to do. So that makes a difference to, you know, makes a difference. You didn't normally have to think about things like that. Of course, it's been a massive, massive change for everyone all across the globe. So um, just to talk about some of your past productions, I've had a, was looking on your website and I saw um, you've done uh, Lysistrata or Lysistrata, depending which pronunciation we're going for uh, this afternoon, um, quite a few times. And, and that's, I think that's really interesting. And I wanted to pick up on, you were saying that you, you cover the comedies as well as the tragedies, and it probably is the most performed Greek comedy, uh, I would guess, of uh, certainly in recent times, um, because it can be presented as either quite a serious piece and quite a feminist piece, or as as a pure comedy. Uh, I I gather that yours was a very comic version. Is that right? It was. I think it also kind of depends what you've been doing before and after. Um, we have returned to it three times in the last. Well, I guess spanning 2010, 2000 and 2017, I think that was the last time we toured it. And um, the first time, actually, it was on our Daily Dose Today, Throwback Thursday, which we've been doing on Twitter and Facebook. And so we had a throwback of the 2010 version. Um, and that was uh, directed by Mick Barnfather. And um, I was playing Lysistrata in that version. And that did a national tour um, and we filmed it. So that was the clip that was on today. And yeah, and he he was, his background, mixed background was 
um, slapstick and circus and maybe a bit of commedia dell'arte. So it was about game, the game and play. And so, you know, that kind of interpretation lent itself. And then I directed it again with um, a different set. Um, so we slightly adapted it and changed the ending, but it was still very comic. I kind of, I, I, I would think I'd been doing a solo show and wanted to, to, to laugh again. So I mean, not that I, you don't laugh, but it's quite hardcore doing a solo show. So working on a comedy was, uh, was really nice to go back to, to that. And so three different versions. And they probably got, maybe they got a bit filthier and filter. I'm not sure. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Um, it's a it's a filthy play, you know. It's um it's pretty hardcore, and and the funniest thing is when you get a school who wants to book you, uh, that says, oh, uh, we want to we we want to have a workshop with you, but can you can you do it really sensitively? And we thought, oh my god, we're we're taking in these really massive fallacies into a school. How are we going to do that sensitively? Um, yeah. So we did have one school walk out. I remember when we were at. Uh, the Lowry many years ago I think it wasn't that version I think it was the version I wasn't in that's right I directed and I think one school I mean they're teaching it so they know what the source is it, it, it's really hardcore and um it still it was a very successful show but you know you do get walkouts sometimes it's not for the faint-hearted I'd say and uh, and exactly the way it was written wouldn't you agree I mean it, this was a out and out comedy oh, in yeah it's a farce yeah, an out and out farce. It's not supposed to be sort of taken seriously. It's fantasy in a way. You know, he wasn't writing it as a feminist piece. I mean, it is. It can be interpreted, and that's a totally warranted way of doing it. Totally justified. Absolutely, that's the power of ancient Greek drama. Uh, I think so. Yeah, it was definitely written in, in that context. <laughs> because it was the premise was was so um out there. Um in ludicrous, the- so absurd that women would ever be in that position, that women could ever be in charge in that in that way. So you can understand it being interpreted as a feminist piece. But you know, years ago in those days we only have uh was you know uh, the three main um playwrights were Aeschylus, Euripides and Sophocles, the drama, uh, the tragedians, and then uh um, you know, uh, Aristophanes as the com- comedy uh, writer and then all the sort of satire plays mm. that may be slightly less, lesser known. Um, but women weren't uh, allowed to, we don't think they were almost 90, 90%, 99%, they weren't uh, probably allowed to watch these dramas. They weren't performing in them. It was uh, three men and a uh, masked men and a chorus. Um, and... Um, you know, that there was, a, it was still quite a segregated society, even though it was seen as a democracy, you know, it was not. So, um, yeah, but to, to reinterpret it in a, as, a, as a feminist piece, absolutely. Why not for the 21st century and the 20th century? Because the male characters you know. are completely ridiculous. But I think back in the day in Athens, that, that would have been laughed at just because we can never see ourselves being like this. Whereas now we can take a, a different view on that. Yeah, I mean the women. The women are the ones with the, with the trousers on. You know, they're the ones who are in charge, and that's the, what's so brilliant about performing and, and directing that piece. And a lot of Greek tragedy, um, very very powerful female roles. Um, so it really does it does really speak to a modern audience in, in that way. Mm. It is interesting that that point generally is interesting. I think, isn't it, that there there are so many powerful female roles in a male dominated yeah. theatrical experience, yeah. as, as far as we know, and and that must speak to something about a fear of women amongst the men of the time, and that the power they did hold in the household and uh, domestically certainly. Um, but I wonder if there's more to it than that as well. And there was. It's something that goes through to, through to Roman time as well, where you get this trope of the the evil stepmother, and there seems to be just a fear of the power of women, even though in theory they didn't have much power, socially or politically. Uh, yeah, I mean, and that continues to today, uh, you know, um, still. And I guess in, in if you compare the roles for women um, in ancient Greek drama to Shakespeare, certainly as an actor. Um, that they're, they're more meaty from, from mm-hmm. ancient ancient Greek tragedy. There's more sort of meaty roles. Um, 
if, in terms of playing um, a female part. And these days it's okay, you know, anyone plays any part. But I'm talking about sort of 15, 20 years ago when it was kind of more traditional, you are going to play a female role. Whereas now it's not it's not at all uh, uncommon to play, you know, to have a female Hamlet or, or whatever. I mean, we did a, a, a female version of uh, the back eye. Um, I, I mean, a female playing. I played Dionysus years ago. And that was only just only because we couldn't find a suitable male role, a male actor for that production. It was like, why didn't we think about that? But but it was it was. Um, a great problem, you know, um, I suppose. But, you know, that, that is a, a much, uh, that is a very good point. Why, why were they so good? Why, why did they uh, write such brilliant female roles? And I don't think I've been to a sort of, had a wider discussion on that subject, um, but it's certainly, I'm sure um, academics have probably written papers about that, why there's such a richness of roles for women, like um, you know the 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 the, the Medeas and the Electras and the Antigones and the Clytemnestra. Yeah, they they are all women that we should hate for the things that they do. But um, I, I have a you know such an <laughs> I wouldn't call it an admiration for Clytemnestra, but I mean as a part, it is wonderful. Must be wonderful to play, and and of course Medea as well. Yeah, absolutely. But I think I have a great, great sympathy for both of those roles and what leads them to do what they do, to be honest. Um, I can't imagine killing my <laughs> child in that respect or murdering my husband. But, uh, you know, I think you, you were playing a role. You have to find a, a, a sympathy in those characters. And I, and I think that there is a lot in terms of the circumstances, the backstory, uh, the um, chauvinism, um, the feeling of isolation and um, being ostracized by society, being an outsider. Um, you know, she's very much an exile, Medea, mm -hmm. for example. Yeah, she's a foreigner um, and, and different, isn't she? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And she's a sorceress who wants to use her powers, you know. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, did, you, did you find that was the way into the character? I mean, because the, the, the things she is expected to do, the things the things she does are terrible. And do they really get explained away by the way she's been treated? Well, I think I think she, although she wins, it's a very hollow victory, you could say. And I think with any uh, drama, I'm interested in finding the true catharsis of the piece. So the complexity of that character, not to, it's very you know, be two dimensional to paint her as a villain, like any any role. Um, there is an, an aspect of that to her character in terms of her kind of uh, the dark magic she has, maybe, and, and the powers and her drivenness and her manipulation. She's she's very manipulative in the piece, uh, but she's also completely heartbroken and uh, completely discarded by Jason, given up everything, you know, for him, and. Um, you know, doesn't not love her children, but she wants to make it more painful for for him. So that so they both lose out because of you know his his actions. You know, uh, he rejects her, and it's 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 you know it's it's sexual jealousy and revenge. It's such a a, a massively exciting subject <laughs> that we that we live with all the time. You know, they're they're, they're such archetypal issues, aren't they? In uh, in ancient Greek drama, they're monoliths. Of, of betrayal and um, honour and all of those things and war and savagery. Yes, and, and that's absolutely why they still resonate because we can take those huge themes and twist twist them to our own times. Uh, and people, um, Well, they, they've never been out of the repertoire to one degree or another. I, I always think about, you know, all the, all the Greek plays we don't have um, – because we only have this oh, yeah. tiny, tiny example of what That's were thousands of plays. And, mm -hmm. and we see these as the three, we assume these are the three greats because we still have them. But, you know, what, what have we lost and what, what other nuances would have been put onto the whole, our whole understanding just by having a few more plays survive? Yeah, who's, who's to say there wasn't a really brilliant uh, women, f female writer, women writer, there at the same time who's been hidden away because they're <laughs> you know they're scared to unearth her because she's better than all the three of them put together <laughs> wouldn't that be just incredible if we discovered that you know Sappho was tremendously um had a tremendous output of you know we've got mostly just fragments of her work but um 
just glorious work. Yeah, it, I mean that would certainly rewrite a few many many a book if uh, that did turn up. Wouldn't it? I know that um, would just be wonderful. I'd love to see that. And um, just just to go back onto Lysistrata for a, a moment longer, um, I just wanted to pick up on the farcical en- element of it because obviously it's easy to make a joke um, about a phallus, and um, that's very visual for one thing, and and it's quite clear in the text, but. There are other elements to the comedy in there that we can pull out and make funny for an audience today. I mean, did you find that was easy to do to make it uh, accessible for a modern audience? Well, the chorus really lend that to help with that, I think, because you've got this group of old, and that's unusual to have two choruses, a, a group of old men and a group of old women. So we had a lot of fun in games. I would say that's that was one of the most enriching uh moments in the rehearsal really exploring the chorus and who those characters were because we only ever have really about five maximum seven actors i think we had five actors on um Lysistrata. so you know we're, we're multi-rolling all the time and so we really had to explore the uh char- characters uh individual characters of those chorus and then switch into the main characters you know so the ambassador would be one of the chorus and then um, and and the only person who didn't do that was Lysistrata, actually, because uh, it's very hard to do that with her. Um, she, sure, she's I'm, on most of the time, isn't she? Yeah, exactly. And so I, th- I think he really helps in that respect. And, um, you know, we had a lot of fun with um, um, trolleys and um, drips and as, as the old men got progressively more and more kind of um, battered and bruised by the women who were, oh, you right. know, yeah it's, that, that was fun and then we had you know you, that, that's open to interpretation isn't it so we, we had like we had a little bit of live music so we had one of the funniest moments I think was was when uh Mark's Mark's chorus character and he also played the ambassador so you see the same actor who's playing this really like John Cleese in, and he's got a kind of John Cleese kind of manner about him anyway then playing this Oh, old man who comes on with a drip like he's just escaped from hospital you know and he plays this he plays a ukulele and he just has a, a completely obscene little ditty that he sings and it always brought the house down one of the, one of the funniest moments in the piece so yes I do think there, there are plenty of moments and and also you know the characters of Mirani of oh, the Mirani Kinesia scene which is famous where you know she's haunting him and and he's getting more and more his his phallus is you know he's getting more and more excited to to, to, to reach bursting point uh you know <laughs> unintended and um, yeah so so I think that it's just littered with possibilities for comedy yes it's uh, basic stuff but still great great fun for an audience in the right mood yeah exactly and in the last time we did it we repositioned the end or the actually the second and the third time um the the, the last scene was in in this in the um kind of sh- uh, shape of a quiz show but it was actually repositioned as a quiz show um so you had the spartan and the greek men um and they were kind of and then you have mollification and you have them kind of on, with their hands on the buzzers and it was a it was you know rewritten it was kind of you know loosely a- adapted by uh, aristophanes i'd say at that point oh, i mean loosely a, a loose adaptation of aristophanes not by him right. <laughs> A you fine, you're, you're following in a fine tradition of adaptation of the Greeks, so don't, yes. I, I don't yes. think you need to yes. worry about that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so you mentioned the back eye there uh, earlier, which uh, is uh, one of my particular favourites because it is so strange and um, I think open to all sorts of interpretations. And you have this central figure of the god who, as you mentioned, is, is fairly um asexual really i mean a man and the the whole cross-dressing thing that goes on in there now that seems to me to becoming even more relevant with the you know the current interest in gender fluidity Mm -hmm. that we've seen in the Mm -hmm. last few years just generally and particularly in the theater as well as as you mentioned there so i mean that was presumably something that resonated with an audience at the time when when you presented that Yes, yes, it did. Uh, I think the audience really picked up on that. 
they um i mean i said i would also that was really just by kind of chance really but we i think we may have considered me playing it but it was only really because we couldn't we didn't find the right male actor that i ended up playing it and it was just fantastic so you had i mean not just the just it, it lent for me it, it gave a tremendous um it was really challenging because it was it was um a very physical production which plays to my strengths as a performer and um the set was a climbing frame like a kind of cave that you could scramble over made of scaffolding that you know i did a speech hanging from one arm and then and then hung from my knees in a hox position it's called which i didn't know that then but that's an aerial thing but i, I hadn't even done any aerial at that point um and so that kind of uh shape shifting um thing that, that dionysus has uh supported that physical you know interpretation really um and then you had of course you had a female chorus because the bacchae are female his followers um the lydians he calls his lovely lydians so you had a vaguely uh, lesbian the lesbian kind of overtones and that was really kind of exciting as well i um, mean this was in 2000 going back so uh, in fact long before any ideas about gender fluidity became trendy uh, well, well before that kind of thing yeah and i know i think judging from the pictures i saw it was an outdoor production is that right oh that one was much later uh that one was loved much later and that was that was the one we did at the national trust at austerley park um that was different again but i did play dionysus again that was but but that must have added something i mean it's it's a kind of an outdoors play isn't it um with everything happening on the mountainside and the the the, the bending trees and all of that so that exactly yes Yeah, it was really lovely communing with nature. Uh, that aspect did, and actually, I rigged a rope in the, the tree, a big tree, which very near this um, I think it was a folly, or was it a building that was very classical? Um, and we used that. We performed. We came out of that, and we had smoke coming out of it when it was on fire. But you know, there's a, there's a moment where. the house is on fire except it's not dionysus it look like it's on fire to confuse pentheus and so we use that and then there was a tree very nicely positioned to the left of that so i made my entrance on that tree uh, from that tree um yeah it was very it is about nature and it is about in a way that medea mentions quite a lot in the chorus a lot uh, of, of to do with nature and nature being sort of subverses forces of earth and forces of nature being kind of um you know not quite right things that the earth kind of erupting and these forces coming out um but the back i really does lend itself probably more than any other uh, ancient greek drama to an outdoor outdoor setting yes the feeling of of power coming from the land is very present in in all of that play even even just reading it you can suddenly get that and did you do you, did you come to firm conclusions about it as a play um in that were you expecting your audience to take away something very specific from it or is it something that you leave for them to make their own decisions about well i think you you want to have a very charismatic uh dionysus so that the audience go on that journey with him or her you know and with with them and um so that in the end when he does what he does or when the death of of pentheus is so violent and so awful uh that you actually think oh my god i was actually kind of hooked into that i was like there what you know you think what's wrong with all this dancing and and you know everything but he 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 he's so he again like medea he's so sort of single single minded and so um peaked by uh this being being rejected because it's another one about rejection really and how you cope with that rejection um so i think that's um is is very much present in that drama but i think i think you need to have that kind of catharsis because it's it's maybe a bit slightly um well they're both they're both demigods um both medea she you know uh granddaughter of helios the sun god and and he's a uh, son of zeus and the mortal semele so they both have that half half god half you know ha- ha- uh, mortal 
aspect, but you still want to be able to go on an emotional journey with with them, you know, and and feel feel for feel for agave, that point when she discovers that she it's not a bull's head she's holding, but her sons is oh my god, it's an incredible moment, heart rending. Of 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 many cruel moments in Greek drama, that has to be one of the worst, doesn't it? It's it's really, uh, and I don't know if that's because you're coming off of all of that frenzy, um, and then you get to this moment, and you can imagine, you know, a, a great moment of stillness in the theatre when she suddenly comes round to realizing what she's done. Yes, uh, when she has that clarity. powerful stuff. Yeah, and I found interestingly, I found that a little bit when I was looking at Seneca's Roman version of Medea, I found some of that in there, I think, with her as well, where she's, because the throwing of the, in that version, you know, she physically throws the children off from the balcony uh, at Jason's feet. And now, of course, there's a great debate about whether this was ever performed or not. It may have just been read, um, you know, in a a Roman salon, Um, but absolutely, you know, the powerful moments there and very dark moments as well that, uh, stay with you for, for a bit when you've read them. I, I saw the National Theatre production of Medea with Helen McCrory in it. And, uh, you know, that too was a very powerful performance. Uh, and it's one of those central ones that probably you can't do any other way. I mean, you, you must have to invest an awful lot in that character to be able to play her. No, absolutely. I would say more than any other, to be honest. It's heartrending. Um, so the last time that we did... Medea was was such an ambitious, our most ambitious production because it was a an aerial, full on aerial production. All of the performers, all five of us, were in harnesses the whole time, and our set was a uh, a wall which measured like three by four by four meters or something. So it was quite a big wall that you could run up on a on a on the vertical and the diagonal, but you had to be hoisted. Yeah, you actually manipulated uh, by you because you were all, you had to lock in, and uh, there was a lot. It was very technical, um, and we did it at the Rose Theatre. So apart from all the emotional thing of playing um, Medea, it was also very physically demanding, and all the uh, the actual aerial connection with the that we made that into quite a very 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 um, visual clue of either it was part of the manipulation, the actual locking in to the equipment. Um, and we also used world music, world music. So we all learnt um, Georgian, Corsican, um, and I think do we have an Armenian song or Greek song? Um, and that added to the kind of richness and um, well, I don't know, monumentality of it really. And, and I had to learn this thing, oh, my, and it was really, it was really tough, called um, an Aman, and um, all it was a song. Uh, it was more like a, um, a call to arms, a kind of lament. It was a lament. And I worked with a, um, a vocal coach, um, well, she was our musical director. She was brilliant, and she really got the most out of us because there are only you know five of us on stage so it wasn't like a big chorus um and yeah so there were lots of different aspects of that production the aerial the singing and and you know the the play itself which is which is immense and um it's it's so physically draining to play that role i think yes well you must have been physically and mentally exhausted after a performance of that yeah I think I, <laughs> yeah, you, you, you want to take the, journey, the audience on the journey with you. It's not that you're, you're going on to some extent that journey, you know, yourself, but you've got to find a balance so that you're not in a position where you exhaust yourself because you have to do it night after night, you know. So, um, I, I mean, we, we'd planned to do a tour. That was a very difficult production, actually. I mean, it, it was lovely, and we, but we, ha- we have never toured it. We only did it at the Rose. And um, it's just such an ambitious piece it needs such a lot of money and um when you're touring uh you know you you have to have a a day before you get into the theater to actually do the get in which is where we normally get in rock up 12 o'clock midday do the show in the evening you know 
Um, this was much, much more involved. It probably would have, might have even needed a two day get in. Um, so it got a really good, good feedback, but it was one of those, um, you know, Arts Council applications that we didn't get beyond the R&D, the research and development. Um, it's something I'd love to come back to. Yeah, that sounds really interesting. So the other play that I spoke about a lot, and I know that you've uh, done, is Antigone. Yes. Which is, I mean, compared to those other, the others we've talked about so far, is is maybe a sort of a quieter, more a more thoughtful piece, uh, less certainly, you know, less obvious uh, strangeness than in the backy. W- was your approach to that very different for from the other plays? I think Antigone really, uh, of all of them, is probably one of the most performed. Plays. I don't know this for sure, but um, I think it, it's such it's so resonant, and because it looks at the battle between the, the individual versus the state and youth versus kind of I guess age power, um, you know um, that that it really does lend itself to many different interpretations and student productions from you know from 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 um, you know, um, full on uh, all bells and whistles at the National Theatre or whatever and, and reinterpretations of that myth and um, that story. So that's probably the one, I mean, we've done it many, many times actually. And um, the last time we did it, well, in fact, the last time we're still doing it, actually, I've come back to it. It's the, in the last sort of three or four years, We've got two different versions. So um, the latest version we're doing is a is an outdoor piece, uh, which is which is not um, Sophocles' Antigone, but it's just inspired by the play, and it's called Savage Beauty. And it's we performed it in um, in my garden here, which I'm looking at now, and it's an outdoor piece. Um, and um, Athena, we call her Athena rather than Antigone. And, um, you know, based on Athena uh, and um, the sort of all the connections with that and uh, sort of wisdom and, um, um, and um, yeah, so she's a climate change activist, a la, a la Greta Thunberg, I, I guess, you know, and, um, or inspired by, and her uncle is the prime minister um and um tiresias is um is a, well the, the role of tiresias is it becomes a character called tessa who is a three-hander so there's only three three actors plus a singer and um she's a scientist um a um a climate scientist so an environmental for the government who loses a job in, in, in kind of disgrace but it's kind of you know it's it's engineered so that she's out of the picture, and um, yeah, we we use we use projection. We did it in the garden, and we had some aerial stuff going on in the tree, and that was very much loosely inspired by Antigone. And we're going to come back to that piece. And the premise is that there isn't a body, there isn't a brother, but there's a garden that's going to be demolished, and she is de- defending um, that, and also you know going against the government, going against the state, going against her uncle. Um, you know, and that was an immersive piece, so the audience can were moving around a bit um, in the garden, and um, yeah, so that was one version that we're still playing. I'm I'm actually rewriting that at the moment. Uh, we're hoping to take it to COP26 in Glasgow, uh, the UN the UN conference on climate change. So we've um, submitted our bid, and we're waiting to hear. Um, I think it would be a really magical piece up there who we were able to do it. Yeah, good luck with that. Yeah, thank you. And that's also features music as well, live music, uh, live singing. Um, and yeah, beautiful. So um, that's one version. And then in 20, actually it was 2017 that we did Antigone, which was a another kind of, I guess, adaptation um, inspired by Sophocles. Um, and it was written by Christopher Adams, um, an American writer who lives in London. And it was a very, very, very different production to anything we've done before. As Again, I directed that and um, it was very, dis- very futuristic. 
uh, dystopian. So we had drones on stage, flying on stage, or one drone. When I say drones, it, you, you imagine a whole bank of them. Uh, we, only, we only needed one. It was very effective. And um, the soul of Polynices was, was represented by a microchip. So, um, and kids, students loved that. I mean, it was a really one of our most successful touring productions. I'd say the whole kind of color scheme and the, uh, in the writing, the, it was, um, yeah, it, it, it did well. It was also one of our biggest tours that we did. And the um, Digital Theatre Plus took that capture, as they call it, on, and it's part of their repertoire now, along with um, Medea. Great. I, well, I mean, you know, the last this conversation just proves, doesn't it, that the Greek plays are still inspirational in so many ways, uh, and they can be tapped into and turned into modern pieces for our age. It's- yes, I know, they, they really can. And in fact, on that note, I've just gone and given myself another headache um, by putting something else in the diary from having spoken to you a couple of days ago. I then went back to talk to Juliet Russell, who's a wonderful singer who runs the choir that I sing with called Vocal Explosion and an amazing storyteller called Fleur Shorthouse who's part of uh, a group called Luna Lunacy uh, Storytelling and um, we're talking about doing a piece in June that's very soon at the end of June Um, but a piece inspired by myth um, yeah with music um, with singing, with with aerial performance, performance and and storytelling. So I don't know at this stage what that's going to be, but we just know we want to do it. So, but you know, I think it will be probably as we just talked about some of those scenes, some of those speeches that are in a garden as well. So maybe looking at how we can connect with nature and 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 in that that environment. Inspiration will strike. Yeah, so I'm looking for a title. <laughs> if you want to write it, you know, send, send your answers on a postcard. <laughs> Absolutely, I'll pass on any messages. Um, and on that note, maybe we should just, uh, is there anywhere people can connect with you and, and the group if they want to? Yes, um, so we are on Twitter at AOD Theatre and um, Facebook um, at Actors of Dionysus. Uh, we have a website as well, actorsofdionysus.com um, and Instagram. I think that's Actors of Dionysus. Um, I'm not so much an Instagram person, much more on Twitter. Um, and then anybody who is interested in uh, the Brighton Fringe should, I guess, just look them up online and your, your stuff will be included there. Yes, uh, we haven't uh, decided exactly, but we're registered for the Fringe. So um, it's going to happen. Um, we, we're waiting to hear about funding for Savage Beauty because that's much more of a, a, a thing to put on because um, than the other piece, than the, the piece I don't know what it's going to be called yet. The Three Graces, we've called it as just a, a, a kind of draft working title. Um, so we're going to see if we get funding for COP26 because uh, on, to take it there and we're, we've, we've applied to it for a digital fund um, to do a digital version of um, Savage Beauty as an, an online uh, choose your own adventure game. So we're waiting to hear back from a fund for that, which would be really exciting. No one's really ever done an ancient Greek drama as a, as a choose your own digital adventure. So uh, I'm guessing not. <laughs> that sounds like a first <laughs> so, to me. Fingers crossed. We get that. Um, but yeah, you can go on the Brighton Fringe uh, website, which I think is brightonfringe.org. Right. Well, Tamsin, thank you very much for your time. Really appreciate talking to us. Thank you. It's a pleasure. So Greek theatre is alive and well, thanks to Tamsin and people like her. Talking about Greek plays in the historical context was a pleasure for me, but to hear about them in performance and finding a vibrant context in the modern world takes it to another level. As this long year of closed theatres comes to an end, I shall certainly be getting out there to see what theatre makers are doing with these classics. I hope you get the opportunity soon too.
I've put the links Tamsin mentioned in the show notes so that you can find her and the actors of Dionysus easily on Facebook and Twitter, and also for the Brighton Fringe and the official site for the UN Climate Change Conference in Glasgow in November 2021. Please also head to the Actors of Dionysus website if you feel inspired to support Tamsin and her team in the work they're doing. Tamsin also mentioned that a couple of shows by the Actors of Dionysus are on the Digital Theatre Plus service. This is a resource hub for educational establishments, which is full of thousands of incredible recorded shows and interviews with actors and other theatre professionals. If you're involved in education, you should certainly be looking at that. And once again, my thanks to Tamsin for taking time from her very busy schedule to talk with me. Next time, we'll be diving further into Greek theatre in performance with theatre director Ricky Jukes. I look forward to your company then, but in the meantime, please take a look at the new website for the podcast. That's www.thehistoryofeuropeantheatre.com. And don't forget to join the Facebook group. If you'd like the old Facebook page in the past, please take a moment to join the group. Unfortunately, Facebook rules don't allow me to simply move you from the page to the group. Details are in the show notes. In the meantime, if you have any comments or concerns, you can reach me by email on thoetp at gmail.com or via Twitter at thoetp.